Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to another session of uh, Learn from the Masters. In today's session, we'll be having Dr. Kavita, who is our consultant uh, in, in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology at Shankarai Hospital, Shimoka. Dr. Kavita will be taking you on a journey through the convergence and accommodation anomalies. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, Dr. Everyone, and welcome back to another session of uh, Learn the master so i'll be talking good morning all i'll be talking on convergence and accommodation anomalies it's a vast topic i hope i'll do some justice so let us see what is convergence it's not a conjugate movement it's a disjugate movement in which both eyes rotate inward so that the lines of sight intersect in front of the eyes. Why this happens? This happens because it has to allow bifovial single vision to be maintained at any fixation distance. Now I won't be going through the basics, just a few uh, relevant points I'll be discussing, uh, that which will be uh, useful Voluntary, uh, what are the types of convergence? There are two main headings. One is voluntary convergence and the other one is the reflex convergence. In reflex convergence, we have the tonic, fusional, accommodative and proximal. Now the one more entity that you, you have to keep in mind is the AC by ratio. This is nothing but a comparison between the accommodation that is occurring at the lens level and with respect to that, we compare how much convergence is occurring at the same time. So we have this ratio called the AC by A ratio, wherein this, uh, an interesting fact about this is that it is stable throughout the life. And accommodation convergence for uh, students, please remember that is measured in prism diopter and accommodation is measured in lens diameter, lens diopter. And this is always expressed as a ratio, as I said, and the normal ratio is anywhere between three to five prism diopters for one diopter of accommodation. Now, what is angle of convergence? And it is the angle formed between the two primary lines of sight during the act of convergence. So if the convergence angle can be larger if the object is closer or if it is, it is smaller if it is the target is at a distance. The few other parameters which we fail to remember or we don't apply it routinely is something like what we call as the meter angle. So just remember, it is the angle formed by the lines of sight of the two eyes when the object is at one meter. So that is the angle and we refer this to as one meter angle. And we want to always compare with convergence. What is, how much is the convergence as well at the same time? So one meter angle convergence is approximately equal to three prism data convergence. Of course, we clinicians, we don't apply much of all this, but thanks to our colleagues, optometrists who do a lot of job on this and they help us come to a diagnosis. And the management, of course, it's a combination between ophthalmologist and optometrist. So a few other meters which of uh, concern is near point and far point of convergence. Now let's see, these are like sisters, convergence and accommodation. So whatever parameters I'm describing will go hand in hand with accommodation as well. I won't be repeating that. Of course, I will just uh, uh, run through the slides there. Now the near point is the closest point at which an object can be seen singly during bifovial vision. Similarly, a far point is uh, refers to a relative position of the eyes when they are completely at rest. It is usually at infinity. Sometimes the eyes may slightly diverge, so the far point becomes negative, that is behind the eye. Now coming to the third parameter is the range of convergence and the fourth is the amplitude of convergence. The distance between far point and near point of convergence is the range of convergence. So normally it is the far point is at infinity. 
and the near point of course it varies from person to person it depends on the age of the person as i mentioned if it's uh, beyond infinity or the slight there is slight divergence at uh, when the eye is at rest then it is negative uh, convergence or you can other words you can interpret it as divergence so everything i tell my students everything is a matter of convergence or relative divergence so it, it depends on the distance at which the target is placed and how the lens and the medial rectus are working so you can tell it is not an absolute value but rather a relative value now what is amplitude of convergence now let us consider what is happening at uh, in terms of diopters so what is the converging power uh, difference in the converging power exerted to maintain the eye in a position of rest and in a position of maximum convergence that difference when you consider then it gives the amplitude of convergence now after uh, discussing all these uh, parameters which as a beginner we might find it little difficult but those who are interested in maths i think they will find it okay so these parameters how do we measure and in other words what i would ask this question what is basically weapon for a clinician or an optometrist the answer is nothing but raf rule it is also known as the royal a force near point rule i know in some clinics it is sitting in one corner of the room not used well we usually check using a pencil for convergence uh, that may not be really accurate but this is a simple instrument very useful gives lot of information in all the diagnosis for accommodation and convergence and all the parameters that are uh, under underlying these two broad headings or adherent to these uh, two uh, entities there are a lot of parameters amplitude fatigue gill sustained many things are there all these can be defined using this single fascinating instrument called the raf rule alternatively what i have shown here how do we self test and diagnose whether we have any convergence problem or not is that you can just draw vertical lines on a plain paper and then keep it at your reading distance and check out bring this paper close to your nose and just check out whether you can see this clear, these lines clearly as singly uh, and roughly you can make out at what distance you can see this is how the biopsy actually experience they keep the mobile far away or the reading material far away so the reading distance gradually increases this is something like that alternatively this can be used so one uh, practical point that i want to tell is i'm not uh, describing in detail the raf rule how it is uh, <clears throat> carried out one mistake that we do is that we keep it parallel to the ground so that should not happen it's usually kept around 42 inclined position 42 45 degree so i just brought in this point if uh, anybody wants to read more about raf rule and the interesting facts that are attached with this uh, instrument is an article which i browsed and found written by indra p sharma called rf near point rule for near point of convergence a short review she is from bhutan it's uh, the journal is annals of eye science now let us come to the anomalies the first and most common one is the convergence insufficiency the incidence is somewhere between 4 to 17% you can also call this as an eye teaming problem there is an inability to obtain or maintain adequate binocular con convergence without undue effort that is very essential the other point is it's not a neuromuscular problem uh, it's a neuromuscular problem rather than just thinking it as the muscle weakness that is the medial rectus so it, there is the nerve impulse which goes to the medial rectus there is an both the nerves as well as the muscle problem as i mentioned it's the most common cause of ocular asthenopic symptoms so this is how it goes how a properly you want to look at a ball and you want to hear a ball how it goes if the eyes are converged properly this is how you look at this ball if there is insufficiency you know that you are saying something like this now what is the etiology for 
convergent insufficiency. There are very many factors. Primary or idiopathic, we put as the first here. Uh, however, there are some uh, certain respiratory factors, general uh, uh, debility, psychological instability, over overwork and worry, uncorrected high refractive errors like uh, high hyperopes, usually greater than five adapters, usually make no effort to accommodate. Therefore, accommodative convergence is deficient. Deficient in myopes. They don't need to really converge much, converge much because they are able to see things which are near very well. So accommodation is less, accommodation convergence is also less. In press biops, then NPA and NPC, as all of us know, recedes. There is less use of convergence. Coming to various muscular balances, imbalances like exophoria, intermittent exotropia, vertical muscle imbalances, if neglected for a long time, may be associated with convergence insufficiency. Then you have the another entity that is consecutive convergence insufficiency, wherein uh, recession of medial rectus is done. So there is some amount of after screen surgery, there is some amount of medial rectus weakness. Now, looking at clinical features, under two headings, we can understand this uh, clinical features. One is symptoms of the muscle fatigue. That means any muscle is working, there is a fatigue entity. Therefore, you have uh, the usual uh, eye strain, heaviness, headache, eye ache after prolonged near work. Now, the most important here is the patient experiences difficulty in changing the focus from distant to near object. You suppose you're seeing an object at a distance and then you want to change over to near. Then this patient experiences real difficult situation to change the accommodation there and hence convergence. Other uh, symptoms may be itching, burning or hyperemia of nasal half of conjunctiva. Now, what happens if there is no maintenance of binocular single vision? So the patient, because binocular single vision, there is difficulty, the patient experiences cross diplopia for near vision. Characteristically, as you see in this picture, the child or the patient will close one eye while reading to obtain relief from visual fatigue. After some time, they experience a kind of strain or tiredness and they don't feel like reading further. So the other way to compensate for this is they close one eye. Now let us look at points to diagnose convergence insufficiency. If NPC is greater than 10 centimeter from baseline, that which I told uh, it is uh, measured using RAF rule. In, uh, if, you, if you want me to say a range, six to centimeter would be the ideal one. Uh, then anything beyond 10, we would suspect that there is convergence insufficiency. Now, we, when you look at fusional convergence, that means both eyes have to converge to fixate at an object. So that is measured in terms of diopters. So you use either a synoptophore or you use prisms. Now, how do we know? You keep uh, uh, bringing the object close or you use prisms to make the eyes converge. If the, patient, if the person is able to converge and focus on the object and see clearly, that means they are able to do it. If they are not able to do it, for example, in synoptophore beyond 30 degrees of convergence, and if you are using prisms beyond 30 prisms of uh, 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 prisms, then if they are not able to fuse and see it as single, then we say there is deficiency in convergence. The third parameter, when you're doing a clinical test, how do you assess? Now you do alternate cover test for all the squint measurements and tests are done both for distance and near. So if there is exo de deviation at near, but the person is straight for a distant object, then you, you can get a clue that this person must be having convergence insufficiency. It, there can be a situation where there is exophoria even for distance, then you can think that there is a negative uh, divergence is more, so negative convergence. So convergence is deficient even at distance, it is possible. 
the fourth parameter is the near point of accommodation may be normal or greater so always i said that convergence and accommodations are like sisters or sister and brother whatever they go hand in hand so along with convergence insufficiency there can be associated insufficiency of accommodation but it can be normal as well you can just have only insufficiency of convergence later i'll be talking about giving some examples clinical situations so you might be able to understand better now what are the treatment treatment is very simple like in squint and all those things there are some three four headings that's all one is the optical so i won't be really going into detail if there is refractive error first you correct the refractive error to correct the refractive error the what is more essential is do a proper cycloplegic refraction especially in children do use using appropriate cycloplegic drug that is when you get the correct reading and you can prescribe glasses according to the guidelines ao guidelines or even our indian guidelines according to our practice and experience you can change the glass prescription accordingly so now usually you fully correct in myopia and astigmatism and in hyperopes in case of convergence insufficiency you slightly undercorrect so that there is some amount of uh, accommodation and that will stimulate convergence so press by up correction all of us know we give according to the age next is orthoptic treatment now there are three headings under which these exercises are implemented or advocated now the first is how to improve all of us know that near point of convergence has receded so what do we do? so we need to tackle that point that is how do we improve the near point of convergence so there are some specific exercises to improve the near point of convergence now second is to increase the strength of this convergence first you have changed the or brought the abnormal value of ntc to normal value now how about next is how to strengthen it that is that is what we are calling it as increasing the amplitude of fusional convergence that is done through synoptophore and prisms and third one is how to help in voluntarily converging so this is also a equally important method so the first one is how to go about improving the npc or near point of convergence all of us know all of us know uh, if there is convergence insufficiency we use the pencil push ups the object for testing uh, convergence insufficiency clinically is also pencil and uh, for uh, exercise is also pencil so pencil push up but i slightly vary in this because a pencil tip or a pen tip is very difficult to focus maybe an adult could do that but a child might be you know it's not an interesting target or very difficult especially if you have refractive error to focus on the uh, tip of the pencil and the color in the second factor is the color of the lead it is light gray so it is not really you know catchy to the eyes as well as attractive for children so i use uh, something like a uh, pencil which has some kind of designs or alternatively you could stick a cartoon picture on a plastic scale and use that as a target basically you need a target to focus on thing and uh, maintain that concentration to focus that particular target or uh, object of uh, interest from the while doing the exercise throughout the exercise rather so you slowly advance towards the nose all of us know how to go about but what is important is that you go till the point at which you see double or uh, you start seeing double okay after that you withdraw go back to a, a place or a point where you can see it as single then again you try to go closer and then make an effort that is important we have to make an effort to see it as single if you are seeing it as double then you make to advise the patient to see it as single till such time and for uh, to remain in that situation for at least 3 to 4 counts so that is like sustaining the exercise that you are doing and slowly withdraw to uh, to the remote point that is your arms length so what is important in all these tests on all the tests right now i just now i will tell is to do the exercises slowly and not to be in a hurry 
and the counts also have to be uh, slow and need to concentrate that is very essential all these are helps this itself will help in your voluntary training of uh, convergence exercises now the other thing is uh, jump convergence exercise as the word says jump so there is your fixation is jumping at here we are mentioning two targets so it is jumping between two targets so first you are focusing at something which is at near point that is 33 cm and later at 6 m so you are jumping it is not a slow process but rather very active and trying to fixate something near and at distance so repeatedly it is done and the near target later the near target is brought closer to the eyes until one can change from distant fixation to a fixation at 5 cm that is within the normal range that is so closer to normal normal is around 6 cm so lesser than that that means if you are able to do that in a person that is with convergence insufficient that means you have achieved your target now the other way of doing the jump convergent exercises is using prisms now similarly you ask the person to fixate an object what you do is you keep a 10 prism diopter i have shown this figure so this is uh, left eye so the base out prism is placed here so what happens to any ray that is going through a prism it bends towards the base of the prism so where is the image falling on the temporal retina so our fixation is here so the eye automatically has to move this way to uh, the so that the macula overlies the image wherever it is getting uh, focused so what happens to the eyeball eyeball is getting converged so slowly of increasing strength of prisms is placed in front of the eyes you start with 10 prisms and then make the person fuse the object which he or she is seeing so slowly increase the prism so that a person is able to come up to 40 prism diopter a normal individual can fuse up to 30 to 40 prisms so here we go up to 40 prisms so this is again uh, using prisms. Similarly, you can do this with synoptophore. I don't have much experience with synoptophore. I used to use earlier, but now I've stopped using. So here, what you do is these tube tubes are, uh, you know, converged. So the angle becomes, uh, you know, more acute and acute. You so that they start uh, seeing the stereopsis lights and they start fusing those lights. Here we take the target as 60 prisms. So as I said, there are always one set of exercises to build up on what is deficient. Here our NPC is deficient. So we managed to do these exercises, simple exercises on prisms, synoptophore and pencil push-ups. And we are thinking we sort of brought in the NPC to normal values or near normal values. Now, what is the next step? Like in real, whenever you exercise, after that, there is always some kind of exercises which help in strengthening the muscle. That is like your weights. It is not just uh, any type of exercise. There's always some uh, exercises which the trainer will teach you how to improve the strength of the muscle. So yeah, our ocular muscles are very tiny and small. Anyway, we don't need this kind of weights, but there are exercises which help in increasing the amplitude of fusional convergence. And the point is here, the differential point is that these exercises are done at same distance. This is the differential point. There, we are changing the distance from distant to near, near to distance, we are changing. And it's a slow process or it is a jump phenomenon. But here, at the same distance, the prisms or the uh, angles, whatever, whatever method you are using, if you're using prisms, you keep increasing the strength of the prisms. So, and the object is at the same distance. You're not changing the dist uh, uh, distance of the object. Similarly, in synoptophore, you'll be increasing the angle of the tube. So the patient is made to converge more and more. 
Now we look at some exercises using convergence chord. This is also another form of increasing the amplitude. So I mentioned abysm and synoptophore. The third one is convergence chord. This is also at the same distance. It consists of uh, dots on either side of a paper. So on one side it is uh, red, on the other side it's blue. The dots are identical in size and are in the same place on each side of the card. So three sizes are, uh, you know, you mark the uh, dots, large, medium, and small. So this card is put in front of the patient's eyes with one end of the card resting on his or her nose with the large dots farthest away so that he or she will read the red dots with one eye and the blue with the other eye. Now the patient is instructed to look at the large dots and to see them fused or blended together, then the middle dots and finally the smallest ones. So this exercise at least has to be at least 10 to 20 minutes or in terms of uh, minutes, probably 15 to 20 minutes per day. That much is required for at least one month to two months to see some improvement in convergence insufficiency. This is very essential in counseling the patients because sometimes uh, you know they just do it for five minutes and they leave it and they expect miracles. It cannot happen. So these are all uh, sustained type of exercises and with a lot of concentration. Now coming to another uh, type is the using uh, Brock string, which we are using. It uh, consists of a white uh, string or white rope, which is of four meters. Of course, uh, there is between three to four meters and even five meters, depending on uh, uh, individual. There are three more, three or more movable color beads. We are using three beads. So the first you have to apply three knots. So the one end is tied to a, uh, okay, let me show you one more picture. So this is how the um, rope is held. So the other end is, you know, it tied to a door or a, a knob or a handle or a window or grill or something. So it's about four meters and the, uh, there are three knots placed. The first knot, let us take from the patient's side at one meter, second knot is at the second uh, second meter, and the third knot anywhere between three meters to three and a half meters. And within the knots, so you have three segments basically. So within that knot, you have these uh, different color beads. So now what you have to do is, in the first step, look at the far end bead for 10 counts. You have the far uh, bead, let us say if it's uh, red color or blue color, whatever, it's at three and a half meters. So you look at that for 10 counts. Then your fo focus should go to the intermediate bead, which is at the second meter. So that again, for 10 counts, you keep observing that bead. The next you shift your uh, focus on the nearest bead, which is at one meter end. Now these, all these three are for 10 counts each. So next step, what you do is move the, each of the beads to the midway in each of the res their respective segments. Now again, you do 10 counts for each of the beads fixation. Now the third step, which is more important is, now after doing all this, you look at the nearest bead. And then you ask, uh, that bead is moved for, uh, closer to you, closer to the tip of the nose. So there, you try to see whether you can see clearly or not. And try, at that distance, you count for 20 seconds, 20 counts. Now you double the duration. So that in convergence insufficiency, this is where we are lacking. So there we have to exercise more. So this is for convergence in insufficiency. Uh, now I will explain how this relaxation also. Now for relaxation, if you have convergent spasm, you do the reverse. You start from near beads and then you focus on the distant beads. Now in all these tests or exercises, it is essential to understand that we need to uh, appreciate the physiological diplopia all through the exercise. And it has to be done slowly and there is a time factor for each of the exercises. That means you allot some time for each. In that particular position, 
or state of i there is you are allotting some time and the muzzle acts now there is one more uh, exercise where you use a stereogram this is a picture of a doll as you can see this is held at arm's length this is a card stereogram card it is held at arm's length in front of the patient now what you do is you bring a pencil in between midway between the eyes and the card so naturally when you focus on the pencil you will see that you will observe diplopia in the images of the card so you will see diplopia means that means there will be four so now when you for shift your focus on to this this card then you will find that you will observe diplopia in the pencil tick so now what is the training required patient is trained to adjust the position of the pencil so this is the position of the pencil so it is adjusted in either front or back so that you fuse the central two pictures and see it as one out of four you fuse the central two pictures and then you see the third one this is how you do this exercise in doing so what happens really you are fixing at this so the convergence is acting here but you are focusing and getting a clear image here so that is the work of the lens which is accommodation so both convergence and accommodation are acting parallelly there is one more exercise done on diploscope i don't have much idea about it this uh, actually looks little bit complex also but uh, i have no idea about this just for completion i uh, put that there earlier probably they were using that now the third thing is training as i mentioned in doing all these exercises there is an element of training of voluntary convergence also but additionally we need to do it as an uh, you know to build up on the amplitude now you have a distant uh, object that is your light and as usual the finger in brought in between so when you focus at finger you will see the light as dist uh, two lights and if you focus on the light then the finger will be appreciated as two so now the you move the finger in such a way to and fro such a way that the uh, lights you either see it as one or double so you are doing this as an exercise when you are doing that the muscles are trained for every uh, distance and the way you view the object the all these are brought into action and it becomes sort of equal that means you either can you can see diplopia at distance that is for the light as well as for the pencil at at the same time you are able to converge and fuse the pencil also as a single object and also you will be able to fuse the light as a single object so whatever you want to do whether it is a, a double vision or a single vision you are training at both the distances so this exercise is completed so there is a target for everything uh, for uh, exams you have target marks if you have some targets likewise this for all these exercises you have some targets so this exercise is completed when the patient is able to double the lights we have a finger so after a prolonged uh, duration of this particular exercise when you tend to remove when you remove the finger you will be able to see those lights as double so that is the target so as you know after you train your body into different types of exercises be it aerobics yoga or running marathon whatever your trainer will always advocate relaxation exercises like as seen in uh, this this person is doing some stretches this is for the back and this is for the whole body lower limbs and upper limbs so you have what is most important is relaxation exercises so so far whatever we did distance to near near to distance in improving increasing the strength of the prisms or increasing the angle of convergence everything now you just do the reverse so this all this exercise is not complete until we teach relaxation exercises for the patients who have convergence insufficiency or for that matter associated with accommodation insufficiency so same same gadgets are used but now everything will be reverse 
in stereogram card we fixed at the pencil now we ask them to fix at the toys so what is happening instead of fixing at the pencil now we are fixing at the card so the eye diverges so it's diverging before we wanted convergence so that the, because there is convergence in sufficiency we wanted convergence exercises now we want the reverse now when you in case of prisms you place the base out prisms so that the eyeball converged now to relax after doing all this now you keep the prism in base in as shown in this figure so the image will fall on the nasal retina so the eyeball will turn out so that the macula and the uh, image will coincide so base in prisms for divergence and then instead of converging the tubes now you diverge increase the angle the, the so first we thought of refractive error correction then the exercises now we will look into prisms as i mentioned when these exercises fail despite few months of uh, therapy then we will think of base out prisms base out prisms are the ones to be used which can be incorporated in your spectacles and lastly surgical treatment wherein we think of resecting or strengthening the medial rectus either in one eye or both eyes for any kind of exercises there are some guidelines which we need to advocate it they should not be done in glaring light do it gently do not strain your eyes rest your eyes after each eye exercises so these uh, things have to be told to the patient it is not just teaching the exercise and leaving at that we need to tell them what are the pros and cons and how long to do at least 15 to 20 minutes per day if they are not able to do it then they can increase it gradually over weeks not uh, days and most uh, essentially is essential thing is to perform the eye relax and uh, relaxation exercises and uh, early morning is the best time to do these exercises now as i said convergence insufficiency can be associated with uh, accommodative insufficiency that in that situation you find that both npca and npa are reduced uh, the treatment modalities remain the same now let us look at paralysis of convergence uh, this completely uh, absence is the convergence uh, what would be the clinical features there is exotropia and cross diplopia on attempted near ad, uh, fixation adduction is normal and accommodation is normal however so etiology any neurological cause like head injury affecting the third nerve tage dorsalis encephalitis and various other conditions now, other uh, neurological conditions uh, of interest are dorsal midbrain syndrome and perinod syndrome both are associated along with this convergence paralysis some amount of vertical gaze paralysis are uh, there so you have to send these patients to a neuro surgeon or a neurologist for further evaluation treatment however in uh, uh, diplopia of course uh, they will have uh, diplopia so we can think of prisms because uh, they may not be able to walk around uh, do their daily activities so we can think of prisms and uh, occlusion of one eye for a while and uh, surgery however is contraindicated in these uh, situations now let us look at the reverse of over action of medial rectus convergence spasm usually it is associated with uh, spasm of accommodation uh, i have not uh, seen per se convergence spasm usually there is uh, some amount of uh, accommodation spasm also uh, they are intermittent episodes now what do they complain they have blurring of vision or uh, double vision sometimes and uh, there can be induced myopia if there is a spasm of accommodation which i'll be talking a bit later now what we have to look out take a clear uh, detailed history is very important in all these uh, situations uh, detailed history you will have to spend time what really the patient is going through because most of the diagnosis can be made in history um, sometimes it happens that you know Uh, we just take it casual headache blurring of vision i can't see near things nowadays because of the changing lifestyle and using lot of gadgets uh, everybody is having some amount of uh, you know induced myopia or whatever uh, we are seeing that those kind of patients more in the opd now so functional hyster hysteria neurosis nevertheless we have to rule out organic causes if uh, uh, 
uh, if the clinical presentation is totally different or you have some doubt on the way they are presenting, uh, it is better to send these patients for a neurological evaluation. Now, uh, yes, uh, the treatment is, I said, neurological evaluation, or you can use atropin if it's associated with uh, accommodation spasm as well. Uh, other way is to occlude one eye. You could do alternate uh, monocular occlusion for a while till they tide over the problem. And psychiatric workup and therapy should be kept as the last resort. Many times it happens, you know, that uh, when patient complains of, uh, I'll be talking about this in accommodation spasm, which we have experienced is that we feel that they are just uh, children, especially 12 or 13 years. Uh, yeah, boys, sometimes, you know, the parents bring them and we feel that they are just complaining, not uh, really uh, serious about what they are going through the problems. No, it shouldn't be that. We, sh we cannot have a casual attitude in this. It's okay to be over cautious. It's okay to be over concerned about the problem. Better, uh, better to consider it, keep it in mind. And uh, if all the tests and of all the clinical evaluation goes within normal limits, then probably we can think of a psychiatric workup. Till then you keep this as last resort, never write uh, the first thing as malingering. This is what I want to tell because many times we tend to write question mark malingering. That may not really... Uh, Now, uh, this is what I want to tell. Quite often we write that word malingering. Now I have a clinical situation. A 23 year old uh, graduate student with complaining of headache and eye strain, eye strain for the past year. She says her vision has always been fine, but a few years ago she was prescribed a pair of reading glasses. They helped only a little. So she wore them occasionally, but lost them after a year. Her past ocular history is otherwise unremarkable. I have highlighted few things in blue. So this is of area of interest. So what is the differential diagnosis and how would you determine the diagnosis? Additional information, she has no past medical history, not taking any medicines. Her manifest refraction is plano OU, cycloplegic refraction is plus 0.5 uh, diopter OU, extraocular movements normal, eyes are orthophoric at distance, and there is a 6PD exophoria at near. A combative amplitude is normal. What is the diagnosis? How would you treat this patient? So straight away, we'll go with, I hope these uh, highlighted points are clear. Not comfortable with glasses, 23-year-old, 6PD exophoria. So differential diagnosis, I would probably put it as hyperopia or accommodate uh, uh, convergence insufficiency or accommodative, uh, accommodation insufficiency. These three things could be there in our mind. So accommodative insufficiency is associated with systemic process such as hypothyroidism, anemia, pregnancy, nutritional deficiencies, and chronic illness. So these questions need to be taken in detail regarding past medical history. However, in this situation, nothing significant was there and no history of medical history. Now let us, uh, what is the next thing that you will want to do? Probably a, do a complete cycloplegic refraction, test for ocular alignment, motility, near and far points of accommodation and convergence and amplitudes. So the second uh, thing would be hyperopia. This would be revealed if the, in, uh, when we were doing a refraction. So convergence insufficiency would be diagnosed by exophoria being greater at near than distance. So this is how you differentiate. So the answer is what is the diagnosis is convergence insufficiency. And uh, what would you do is orthoptic exercises to improve fusional amplitude, amplitudes. Most common is the pencil push-ups, and most useful also, it is quite useful. And another option is base out prism glasses to stimulate convergence. Rarely surgery is required. So this just, I brought in one clinical scenario which covers up the whole convergence insufficiency. So another book which can be read, which uh, uh, I found it useful is Clinical Management of Binocular Vision written by Michelle Sheeman and Bruce Wick. This can be referred. Now let us look into accommodation and its anomalies. 
So accommodation is the mechanism by which all of us know that there is a change in refractive power with the change in the shape of the uh, lens. As I mentioned, these are the same four headings, far point, near point, range of accommodation and amplitude of accommodation. I would not be going in detail. Now the, there are various theories, about five theories. Uh, I would be just uh, telling the highlights of this. The relaxation theory of Elmos, which is the most accepted one, which I think it is all, all of us have this concept embedded in our uh, brain or the other way, it is also known as capsular theory. Lens is elastic, so in normal stage, it is stretched and flattened by the tension of the suspensory ligaments. The ciliary ring, uh, short, ciliary muscle shortens the ciliary ring and uh, moves towards the equator of the lens during accommodation. So lens assumes more spherical form, increasing thickness and uh, di uh, decreasing the diameter. So this is uh, proved in imaging techniques and uh, also in gonio videography. Therefore, therefore, it is most accepted. Then you have the Gullstein mechanical model of accommodation, which is uh, based on Helmo's uh, hypothesis itself. Only thing it is considering even the choroid into action. So when the ciliary muscle contracts, uh, there is uh, there is some elasticity of choroid also. So which is supposed to be stronger than the lens. So this also pulls in the choroid. Uh, however, uh, this is not so accepted. Shesha's theory of accommodation brought in the concept that the central surface of the lens steepens. That's how I remember. Shesha's is having uh, two double C. Double C is there. So central surface of the lens steepens. You just remember that. And then Schoenig's theory is T. So there is tension in the zonules. For students, I have to tell this. So because all these theories, they have to write in the theory paper. So some way we have to find a way to uh, remember these. Uh, Schoenig's theory, T is there. So tension of the zonules, basically it is attributed and uh, to this tension and there is a curvature of the lens and its capsule. The last uh, theory is the quaternary theory proposed by Coleman. Here, uh, this is a slightly different concept. So they brought in, proposed that lens, zonules, and anterior vitreous acts like a diaphragm between the aqueous, the front part, and the vitreous at the posterior. So as the ciliary muscle contracts, it forms a pressure gradient between the two, causing the anterior movement of the lens, zonules, uh, diaphragm, and increasing the anterior curvature. I think this one, uh, somehow we should remember it because it has a different mechanism. So here, the lens, zonules and the anterior vitreous, vitreous, it acts as a diaphragm. The various uh, important aspects of accommodation testing is the amplitude, the accommodative facility and response. So all these are measured. If you can understand it's good, otherwise uh, there are simple ways to understand it. I'll just explain that. So accommodative amplitude facility and response. In accommodative uh, amplitude, there is something called push up test and pull away test. It is nothing but again, you're using the RAF rule. So that is why I gave you the link, uh, material for reading up RAF rule. There are some interesting facts as well. So you can read that up. In just with single equipment, we can measure so many things. So both push up test and pull away test, the target is moved here. And then for accommodation, you're using the letters, not the vertical line. The most important is that. For convergence, you're using the dot with the vertical line. But for accommodation, you're using the other three sides of the box, which runs over the RAF rule. I hope you remember. So in this, you are looking at when these letters become blurred. So that is the near point of accommodation. So push-up test and pull-away test are just reverse. Push-up is from the rear end of the RF rule, you are pushing the box, uh, the move, moving uh, box over the RF rule to close up or the near point where uh, till such time that uh, letters are seen as clearly. Now pull-away is reverse. You go from near point to the far point. Whatever test you are doing, this test, uh, we have to remember one thing that all these tests are repeated at least three times three times 
and each eye separately, right eye, left eye, and binocularly. And average of all these is considered as the value to be taken for your evaluation of whether there is a convergence or accommodation in sufficiency or not, or other way around, whether there is excess accommodation or convergence excess. So three readings at least is required, right eye separate, left eye separate, and both eye. So you take the average of this. So just remember there's one more important formula, which is more commonly used and very simple as well, of status formula. This is nothing but here, uh, for average, there are three uh, readings again here, average, minimum, and maximum. The formula is 15 minus 0.25 into H. So this is the formula that is used. Along with that, you have the values which are there on the RAF rule. When you're doing the test or the analysis, you get the values on the uh, rod itself. Now looking at accommodative facility. So these are uh, uh, chart you have. Uh, what is facility is how much of work they can do accommodation. The way we thought of convergence, how much we use prisms and estimated what is the strength of the muzzle. Likewise, you have to understand what is the facility of accommodation. How much time they're able to do this accommodation. So. Uh, the accommodation is basically you are looking at one object A and then you're shifting it to a, your focus on object B. So how rapidly or how uh, fast you can do or how long you can do is what is determined by accommodative facility. So you have these flippers which have the lens powers like minus two on one side, plus two on the other. Like that, there are many flippers which can be kept in front of the eyes. So when you keep changing plus and minus of various powers, plus 0.5 to plus 4 up to that, you can keep changing. You can understand whether that particular pair of eyes can accommodate, can converge and accommodate and focus clearly or not. If not, how long it's taking? If not, the other thing is how long they can do this uh, test is what is we can analyze by facility. So this facility now we measure in terms of time. It, how long they can focus, how long, how much is the capacity? This one is measured in terms of time. So it is written as cycles per minute. This is cycles per minute. So you have the timer there and you keep flipping these plus lenses and minus lenses. You start from 0.5 to plus up to four datas you can use or 2.5, whatever is the situation, how long they can do. Up to one minute, how many times they are able to immediately focus when you keep changing the lenses is what we are going to look at. So difficulty is seen with minus lenses in uh, patients with or people with presbyopia. And with plus lenses, especially it is very difficult in children with accommodation excess. These are the normal values. Ideally, what happens in when you do monocularly, you get different kind of value. But when you do binocularly, it is usually these values are lesser. So usually commonly used is the plus and the minus two flippers. So you see now I told you it is measured in terms of cycles per minute. So you ha should have a timer when you start the uh, test or uh, this kind of examination and you keep changing the flippers. Now looking at assessment of accommodative response. So this is done monocularly. Here it is nothing but uh, doing the near retinoscope uh, method that is near retinoscopy. In each eye you do separately. The target is actually is a reading chart. As you can see, there is a space for your retinoscope uh, uh, light uh, to pass through the eye. This is fixed on to the streak retinoscope and you do the retinoscopy in each eye separately. A finding below plane or above plus 0.75 should uh, make us suspect that there is some abnormality. Now let us look into anomalies of accommodation. Decreased, there can be two things. One, it can be decreased or increased. In decreased, these are the stages sort of, I would say. The first is insufficiency or rather I would put it as ill-sustained, milder form of decreased accommodation, insufficiency, inertia, 
and last is the severe form this is one end of the spectrum is the paralysis if if it's increased what are the two types is excess and spasm you should know how to differentiate these two which i will be giving you examples later now insufficiency of accommodation as i have already mentioned it is associated with some amount of convergence insufficiency as well so in which accommodative power is constantly less than the lower limit of normal range according to patient's age most important is is when you look at the rf rule in detail there is the age on one side of the uh, rod it's not a rod it is a square so you have four sides on that uh, uh, rod i should say uh, so one will attribute to the age so everything all these values go in with respect to the age so what are the causes for uh, insufficiency of accommodation is we all we all know premature sclerosis of lens and uh, local weakness that is the ciliary muscle weakness due to uh, due to systemic causes and weakness of ciliary muscle due to local causes you should know that this is illness anemia toxemia malnutrition diabetes important factor uh, pregnancy stress stress nowadays it's one of the uh, common factor with changing lifestyle then uh, local causes are the ocular causes like uh, glaucoma mild cyclitis and sympathetic ophthalmia so any inflammation at the level of ciliary muscle can bring about weakness of uh, accommodation so typically this uh, all these uh, uh, symptoms are there eye strain fatigue irritation all these are common but what is specific for insufficiency of accommodation which i told you is the blurred vision for near work blurred vision for near work they are not it is it may not be possible or it may be possible but they are not able to do it for a long time along with that if they have diplopia that means you have to think there is associated disturbance in convergence insufficiency as well now uh, treatment is you identify what is the cause in that particular patient and next is of course you correct the refractive error if there if there is any near, near vision is blurred so you can think of uh, additional near correction so, similar to the way we prescribe uh, pres uh, in presbyopia we have to uh, sometimes the theory is different from practicals so sometimes you know you have to keep those glasses and try it out yourself which power or be it minus lenses or plus lenses you have to keep it in front of the, uh, those eyes eyes patient's eyes and check it out with which they are comfortable and then prescribe you know theoretically we can say up to prisms for example we can give up to eight prisms or so like that but uh, manufacturing also is not possible they manufacture up to six prisms then you have to divide it between the two eyes then you check it out whether uh, they are comfortable with whatever you want to really prescribe what you want to prescribe is theoretical what patient accepts is what you really need to uh, prescribe that is what uh, i want to uh, give importance to if associated with convergence excess then full spherical correction is advocated now coming to exercises in accommodation this is called the heart chart this uh, see there are so many letters and some numbers 1 2 3 4 5 6 this is how it's numbered now these letters are of bigger size this is of smaller size so logic says that the small bigger one should be placed at now i already mentioned that all these exercises and testing is all done for distance and near distance and near because the phenomenon physiological process is like that be foundation or convergence it is occurring at various distance so arbitrarily we are taking two distance that is near and distance so the large letters will go for a as a distant target then smaller letters will be at a close distance this is the clue that i'm giving so this how 
the heart chart exercise, we commonly advocate this for accommodation insufficiency. Of course, convergence insufficiency is more common in our clinical practice as compared to accommodation insufficiency. But as I mentioned earlier, the RAF rule is underused. I sometimes feel we are underdiagnosing convergence insufficiency or accommodations insufficiency or the other way around spasms. So these patients need to be evaluated completely nowadays because of the varying or changing, drastically changing lifestyle, I would say rather now. So all these uh, equipment should go into use more frequently. So this is how this is being done. The smaller letter chart is kept at a closer or reading distance. And this is like say about one and a half, two meters. That's how you can see this letters. And uh, one eye is closed or patched. This is not correct the way it has been occluded by the hand. It is not possible to hold on like that. You just patch that eye and the right eye is using this. So one line is read here. And then we shift the area of interest to the distant chart. So there one line has to be read. So alternatively, the second line has to be read and then the other line in the uh, distant chart. This is how the whole sequence has to be done. Then you change the eye that, uh, which needs to do the exercise. Now right eye can be blocked and then left eye can be done. So next heading is the ill-sustained accommodation. I said there is accommodation, but in this situation, they fail to sustain for a long time. So this can be seen in stage of convalescence or in a short period of uh, generalized weakness or tiredness. Uh, that also can be picked up by RF rule. Uh, during this, probably one would advocate uh, that uh, they are, you know, stop doing near work, uh, near work till they tied of this debilitating illness and improve their nutrition and probably the reading, the posture, illumination, all this need to be improved. So that's why I say a detailed uh, history is also very important. Inertia of accommodation. So here there is an inertia. That means from shifting from one distance to another, there is difficulty. The patient faces difficulty in altering the range of accommodation in other words. So amplitude is normal. So treatment is again, correct refractive error and advocate these uh, accommodative ex exercises. Luckily, there are many exercises even on the computer, uh, computer software. There are many exercises, not all of them need to be done. Probably a few, maintain them, and then probably increase over a period of time if they feel comfortable. Otherwise they can stick on with whatever they are doing. Now, coming to paralysis of accommodation, this is the uh, severest end spectrum at the end of the spectrum. So this is, can be caused by drugs, internal ophthalmoplegia, meaning to say that there are paralysis of the ciliary muscle or sphincter pupillae. And the third situation is third nerve paralysis. In this, we know that there will be blurred vision at near. They can have photophobia because pupil is dilated. And sometimes if there is, uh, there could be diplopia and micropsia. So look into the history, eliminate the cause. And uh, sometimes recovery is possible if it is drug induced or uh, infective causes. Uh, to avoid uh, photophobia, one can uh, give dark glasses. And uh, so these patients will not be able to focus on ear. So convex lenses might be of help. Now we'll go to the other uh, side of the coin, that is excessive accommodation. Accommodative response is greater for any kind of stimulus, as I have shown in this picture. The child is looking, eyes are straight, ortho. But as soon as I gave him a target, immediately there's a stimulus, the eyes go into ESO. So this is accommodation, which is coming into action. There is a functional increase in tonus of ciliary muscle, which results in constant accommodative effect. Now, what could be the causes? Young hypermetropes frequently use excessive accommodation as a physiological adaptation. Myopes performing excessive near work, excessive near work on mobile and all the gadgets associated is associated with excessive convergence. Sometimes in uh, patients with astigmatism, 
press biopsy in the beginning and use of improper and ill fitting spectacles can also bring about this so what are the precipitating factors as i mentioned it is excessive near work uh, dim light and uh, general debility and mental ill health symptoms are same blurred vision at near sometimes it, there could be blurred vision even at distance photophobia can be there and inability to change or focus from distance to near this uh, accommodation access has good prognosis so all we have to do is use appropriate cycloplegic drug and get the refraction done uh, correct the refractive error if it's there then near work has to be discontinued for a while encourage good visual habits the most most important uh, is uh, pseudomyopia or spasm of accommodation which is of uh, uh, of priority i would rather say because now the frequency is increasing so in this case the causes could be myotics long term use of myotics the spontaneous attempt to compensate compensate refractive anomaly excessive near work is done with bad illumination bad reading position state of neurosis mental stress or anxiety nowadays i'm finding that there is an element of mental stress in children uh, i'm talking about children because uh, doing that practice uh, either parents are uh, over ambitious and they want the children to be the best so these children they are going into kind of uh, Uh, stress and uh, they have this kind of uh, near vision uh, problem so especially before a one month or two months before exams you have all these children coming in uh, to our opd with decreased vision so the other causes are iridocyclitis neuro neurological uh, causes and toxic reaction to some drugs so what are the clinical features so they give typically a history of varying blurred varying blurred vision i would rather say sometimes it's some blurred they are sometimes they are able to focus and it is of a short duration and it is quite troublesome that they come to you so there may might be other associated symptoms maybe there may not be there the other thing is when we examine there is varying visual acuity this is what i was trying to tell earlier varying visual acuity measured by different people and by the same person as well if you measure three times each time you get a different visual acuity reading so that's when we think that patient is malingering not wanting to go for exams or so like that and we think that we and our management starts in that direction rather than really being concerned that something really is going on bcva that is best class correction or best corrected visual acuity these patients accept minus lenses even to the extent uh, we have seen that they are accepting about four, minus 4 minus 5 which is unusual and all of a sudden so one should think of the spasm of accommodation near point is abnormally close when you do it on the rf and uh, what is advocated is a good cycloplegic refraction there you will this will help us in our diagnosis when you do the refraction this will be within normal limits so what is the treatment Tre treatment yes advocated is atropine i use home atropine one drop per day and uh, use it for a month or so and then you have a close follow up on these patients meantime you need to explain to them about the side effects of the drug as well as the blurred vision that they could have for near Uh, home atropine i uh, prefer because uh, it keeps the pupil mid dilated it doesn't cause too much of photophobia like uh, atropine so along with this i also advocate punctum occlusion so the side effects of the drug is not at least if not completely at least it can be avoided so avoid near work for short period uh, meantime i uh, look into their personal aspects uh, whether they have any kind of uh, stress that they are the patient is going to then these will help in you know, psychological uh, counseling can be done 
so mainly we are looking at the cause and eliminating the cause a uh, couple of patients i have given uh, prescribed glasses because on repeated follow ups not really improving with uh, uh, cycloplegic patient had the glasses so i have prescribed and with the word of uh, uh, caution or with the extra words being told that this glasses can be avoided later and uh, after this what is essential is that these patients go through vision therapy so they go through these accommodation exercises so that will help in maintaining accommodation for distance as well as uh, for near so as i said watch on the side effects of uh, side effects of the drugs that you are using allergy blurred vision and most important because these all of these are coming with the preservatives so we have to look out for epithelial damage which probably we could advocate uh, lubricants along with that and uh, initially a frequent follow up would be better so that even a patient's uh, parents or patient's attenders gain confidence in what you are giving because you would have explained the side effects so they will want to know what really is happening so better to call them frequently and check out how the patient feels most of them are comfortable with uh, these cycloplegics and then later you can wean them off now we'll come to few three clear clear situation eight year old child complain of blurring of vision while seeing far objects immediately after seeing near object vision is 66 and 6 near point of uh, accommodation is od is 20 diopters os is 20 diopters ou is 20 diopters according to offsetters for value according to the age per se it's about 16 diopters which i mentioned that it is 15 minus 0.25 into h so it is 16 diopters and uh, your retinoscopy is minus 0.75 in right eye minus 0.75 in left eye near point is 6 mm 6 cm so what could be the diagnosis as you see that the npa is increased as compared to the age related or age according to age whatever value we were supposed to get it is more than that so near point of accommodation is increased so it goes in favor of accommodative excess because uh, myopia is not much and the vision is 66 now 35 year old decreased vision for near and head work headache for near work vision is 66 and 6 in both eyes npa is plus 5.5 in right and left and both eyes so it's almost 5.5 offsetters value according to age is plus 8 so what's npc is 13 cm so it is more than 10 cm so this uh, patient has both accommodative insufficiency and convergence insufficiency which i mentioned both can exist together now carry home message and points to ponder a careful and detailed history a methodical and attentive evaluation is required i have written attentive because we can't be casual on any uh, history that is being told or any finding that we get try to uh, arrive at an accurate diagnosis because without diagnosis we will not know on which track to go ahead in this topic con- uh, relating to convergence and uh, accommodation i think the key gadget key weapon is raf rule for which i have given you the link as well appropriate treatment has to be executed or given glasses prisms and vision therapy most important so points to ponder i have said what is raf when was it introduced raf rule and where and how many modifications has it undergone till now so if you read that article probably not that article i have read many other articles so how many modifications has it undergone from the time it was introduced into clinical practice this is what i want to leave behind at the end of this topic thank you i hope i have done some justice thank you very much dr kavita it's been a very comprehensive talk on uh, accommodation and convergence and its anomalies uh, there are some questions i'll just read them out uh, dr manu is asking while using prism will the refixation or herring's law prevent binocular singular vision mm-hmm. uh, the 
I'll just try reading the question. While using prisms, will the refixation herring law prevent? It's a very transient uh, phenomenon, refixation, which is taking place. So to actually wanting of binocular single vision only, we are taking up fixation, right? So it's a very, very short duration. I don't understand the question. What exactly uh, Manu wants it? There is a refixation, but it is a very short duration. Go to the next question. It is how long should pencil push ups be continued before terming it a failure? And any alternative home exercises for convergence insufficiency? Yeah, now at least four to six months is what is required. But as I said, these patients, how uh, religiously they are doing what is you have to keep in mind. And uh, uh, more, uh, what I have found is many times correcting the refractive error itself has brought down the convergence insufficiency. That is what has been missed out many times, even the cylindrical power. So you need to do it at least four to six months, but it is better to, you know, they have a diary, like what we advocate for occlusion therapy. If they have a diary as to how many minutes they are doing per day and how effectively they have done. So it is, uh, there is no really, I wouldn't say a really a time factor, only six months and then you cut off. No, you each time you keep looking at these parameters, which was uh, were showing earlier higher values. Now, if it is decreasing, then it is showing good. Then probably you could have a maintenance and uh, home therapies are available. Then that also can be done for a uh, maybe one to two years. Uh, Dr. Dev Thomas is asking uh, the role of synaptophore in correction of insufficiency is accommodation and convergence, and the role of uh, 0.01% atropine eye drops per and how long in spasm of accommodation? Synaptophore, I have uh, don't have much experience, but wherever we have tried, it has given a faster uh, improvement compared to all other therapies. This is what I have observed. And the other thing is where, it, where the situations are difficult, synoptophore has really helped. But the only thing these has to be, the patients have to come for to our OPD and this has one hour of our uh, optoms or somebody has to do it on these patients. It's very effective. All of atropine, it is one drop per day. You use it for one month and see how it goes, how the vision improves, how the patient feels then you can make it, I make it alternate day, then pro, then I taper it off slowly. I use home atropine, I don't use atropine. Atropine really dilates the pupil. So home atropine keeps it uh, at the size of say, three to 3.5 or less than four millimeter. So that's quite comfortable. I am comfortable with that. My patients are comfortable with home atropine. So one to two months, you try it out, how it goes. Then along with that, I advocate some kind of relaxing exercises at home. If they do not have any activity other than near activity, I would encourage outdoor activities. Outdoor activities, pranayama and breathing exercises. Because all these patients are type A patients who go for spasm of accommodation. So you advocate all those and eventually they are comfortable or they don't come for follow-up. So you presume that they're doing okay. Right. Uh, Dr. Rajshree Reddy has a question. She says, uh, any relation between early presbyopia and estrogen insufficiency in females? I, I had, don't have any uh, really knowledge on this, uh, but hormonal changes uh, may be affecting it. That's what I feel. I really don't know about it. I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. P.T. Jain has a question. She says, uh, the, ACA by, the AC by A ratio is stable. So can we conclude with increasing age in, a, increase in age, convergence also decreases in proportion with accommodation? Yeah, that's how that ratio goes on. That ratio goes on because less accommodation. Now let's say other way around. That's what they are like sisters. 
if accommodation has to act convergence has to act if convergence has to act along with that accommodation also comes into action so because accommodation near point of accommodation receives so there is a less, less requirement for convergence to act you take it that way okay uh, dr ishwar sakare has a question he says if a patient has refractive error and accommodative or convergence insufficiency and patient wants a refractive surgery how do we proceed accommodative or convergence insufficiency now uh, if convergence insufficiency is there i would rather expect some amount of deviation Ex exophoria or exotropia isn't it so usually we will take it as exophoria is there yeah because it's not very clear how much is the insufficiency i think if it is exophoria we can go ahead with refractive surgery but if there is a gross deviation if there is a gross exo deviation rather we would first correct the squint because they need to fix it when they're doing the lasik surgery uh who have large deviation i would rather do the squint in that situation i would do the minimal sparing surgery i would uh, take a phonix based uh, conventional incision or a paralimbal incision of the on the conventional and do the squint surgery and after a couple of months they can go ahead with the uh, uh, lasik surgery uh dr sri ram charan has a question is asking the sensory evaluation in these anomalies and the effect on stereopsis uh see eventually sensory uh, we are all looking at uh, these insufficiencies is looking at binocular single vision so when we improve this automatically the stereopsis also increases if it is deficient that depends on the amount of insufficiency that is there so it will improve uh dr preeti has a question she is asking what about usage of cyclopentolate and tropicamide in patients with accommodative spasm tropicamide doesn't have a cyclo cycloplegic effect it's only a dilating drug so it will not have any effect do not use that cyclopentolate i do not use because uh, it has a higher risk of uh, allergic reactions side effects and it keeps a few much dilated i don't like the cyclopentolate has a side effect which i want to tell because everybody is aware of it uh, sometimes has some kind of uh, hallucinations which comes up in a child or a patient and they behave very abnormally neurotic type of i mean of course that severity varies from patient to patient some of them some situations it's mild and in some situation it is too much that even parents and we cannot see the abnormal love behavior after you still cyclopentolate so i would uh, rather defer that and use homotropin with punctum occlusion uh, dr devakani has a question she says when to consider bifocals in accommodation and convergence anomalies and what should be the strength of addition and what should be the strength of homotropin and atropin okay homotropin is 5% atropin is 1% it's one drop per day that is how it's recommended then you give it for a month and then you can probably uh, you know seeing how the condition improves you can uh, make it alternate day bifocals in a ac by a ratio if accommodation convergence is more in the sense when you are doing alternate cover test you find that there is eso deviation which is more for near say about 10 to 15 prism diopters more than more for near than distance as i mentioned all these tests are done squint especially are done both for distance and near so you have a eso deviation which is more for near about 10 to 15 diopters more than what you get for distance you should think of giving a bifocal so arbitrarily we are giving about plus 2 or 2.5 but at the same time what practice i have is i check how their near vision is first 
Second point is I check how the squint decreases. So when you're giving a bifocal, you can't give a bifocal when you're testing, right? It is only a prescription that you give. So when you are testing clinically, you check for the deviation with a near target. A near target is any letter on your near vision chart or any kind of a cartoon or a picture that you can show at uh, 30, 33 centimeters. You ask the patient to look at that and you keep that plus two or 2.5 and then you check whether the deviation has decreased. Okay, if satisfied, if you are satisfied, then you can prescribe. Along with that, what I do is, because later when you have prescribed this bifocal and if they are not able to read because the muscles cannot relax, they will complain that they cannot read and this parents will become more apprehensive. So you can start from 1.5 to 2.5 and keep checking how the squint decreases and at the same time check on how the vision improve, how the vision is. If the vision is deteriorating, then I would probably take that as a cutoff mark, cutoff point and prescribe that classes with one word of advice to the parents saying that this child, in case the squint has not come down completely, then I would say that this child might need a higher ad or high, a higher plus power for the near at a later stage. This is how I would go about. So you can start from 1.5 to 2.5. Ideally, textbook description is 2.5, but I wouldn't really go with that. I would start from a lower value, then increase it, balance both near vision as well as how much is the squint. Okay, both I will look into before really I prescribe. Uh, I think we'll take this as the last question because we're running a little short of time. Uh, this is a question by Dr. Soumya Jain. Uh, it's, the question is, what is the treatment for accommodative infrasleepy and can it progress to insufficiency? Yeah, it can progress and the same methods that you do uh, is uh, correct the refractive error. And for all this, this heart uh, exercises works very well. This is what we have found. This uh, heart chart uh, exercises there. You can advocate that for the uh, patients. So this has to be done slowly, increase the frequency and in probably increase the duration and then they will come out of this uh, thing. But what is causing them, causing this condition is needs to be evaluated before we really advocate the exercise. Otherwise also exercise is good enough. Uh, well, I think that answers most of the questions. And if anybody has any further questions, I think uh, Dr. Kavita will be free to I'd we'll we'll like to take the questions personally. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kavita. It's been a very nice and comprehensive uh, cover of the topic. I know it's a very extensive topic, but I think it's been dealt very well. Thank you very much. Thank you and so much, Dr.